this will be lecture number 11 on mechanical measurements in the previous lecture that is lecture number 10 we were discussing some details about thermoelectric thermometry or the use of thermocouples for the measurement of temperature we were in fact discussing the kelvin relations which relate the three effects the peltier the thomson and the Seebeck effects. We have two relations between these three quantities called the Kelvin relations and we were just discussing how to obtain the Kelvin relations and then we were looking at some details of what follows from these relations. So, in this present lecture what I am going to do is to continue from there and I will go back to the Kelvin relations and uh, discuss it more fully and then I will take an example where I am going to show how the Kelvin relations are going to be useful in describing the characteristic of a thermocouple specific thermocouple and then we will discuss something about thermocouple materials, the types of materials we use, the method of making junctions and so on these are all very practical aspects of thermometry, thermocouple thermometry and then we will also discuss in uh, relation to the fundamental thermoelectric uh, laws we have uh, discussed in the last uh, lecture, we will discuss about the basic thermal thermocouple circuit and some of the practical aspects of thermocouple circuits bringing in what we call as laws of thermoelectricity. Just to recapitulate, the Kelvin relations were derived in the last uh, lecture and I have just recapped, want to recapitulate by writing them down here. The first one is pi the Peltier coefficient or Peltier effect co coefficient A B is the pair of materials we have chosen material A and material B is equal to the absolute temperature T times the Seebeck coefficient alpha subscript S. So, this is the first uh, Kelvin relation. The second Kelvin relation relates the Thomson heat sigma A minus sigma B, this is the difference in the Thomson, Thomson coefficients in the two materials that is equal to negative of the temperature absolute temperature d alpha s by d t. Just remember that these were delay derived with the two junctions held at very close temperatures to each other. One of them was t, the other one is t plus d t. There was a small difference in temperature and therefore, these are differential in nature and uh, what we have is a relationship between alpha s the Seebeck coefficient again it is coming here the pi the Peltier coefficient and the sigmas which are the Thomson coefficients. So, if you look at this and uh, look at what I am going to show in the next slide, I am expecting that there is a certain relationship between the Seebeck voltage and the temperature. From now onwards I am going to use two different temperatures capital T will be representing the Kelvin temperature or the absolute temperature in the Kelvin scale and I will also use the lower case T for the temperature in degree Celsius. So, whenever I use the capital T it is understood that we are I am referring to the absolute temperature when I use the lower case T I am representing or referring to the Celsius temperature. In uh, practice normally what we do is we hold one of the junctions at the ice point and we will call it as the reference junction and the measuring junction is the other junction which is going to be used which is going to be exposed to the temperature we are going to measure. So, before going to the thermal the, the thermocouple circuitry aspects which will come a little later, let us assume that there are two junctions the measuring junction between A and V at a temperature capital so lower case T which is the degree Celsius and the reference junction is at a temperature equal to 0 degree Celsius corresponding to the ice point. I can represent the V s t relation by requiring that at least it should be a quadratic, because if you go back to the previous slide I see that there is a the Peltier coefficient is proportional to alpha s, alpha is nothing but d s d v s by d t it is the rate of change of V s with respect to temperature therefore, this is the first derivative of the V s with respect to temperature 
and uh, because sigma a minus sigma b is related to d alpha s by dt which is actually the second derivative of v s with respect to temperature. If you think in terms of a Taylor expansion around uh, the temperature t you will get we can at least we should at least have three three uh, three terms in that expression. Of course, the first term which corresponds to a constant will be 0 because I am taking the reference temperature at 0. That means, if I put t equal to 0 you can uh, see here if I put uh, t equal to 0 this should be 0 this should be 0 v s equal to 0. So, I am requiring that the if the measuring junction is at the ice point there should be no output and therefore, I am going to take it as v t plus c t square this is the minimum we should have. In fact, in practice we usually go for the fourth degree polynomial or even higher degree polynomial depending on the requirement. So, using V s equal to B t plus C t squared pi I am now uh, dropping the uh, suffix A v if you want you can put it back here pi is equal to T times alpha alpha is nothing but the differentiation of V s with respect to temperature and now in the Kelvin relationship we were using only the capital T as far as the derivative is concerned whether you take derivative with respect to capital T or lower case T is of no significance it will be the same. Therefore, I will take it as T into d all d d v s by d t where T is the lower case temperature that will be differentiating that I get B plus 2 C T and sigma a minus sigma b the difference in the Peltier the Thomson heats is equal to minus T times d pi d alpha d alpha s by d t and d alpha s by d t is nothing but 2 c that is the this coefficient. So, actually b plus 2 c t you differentiate once more you get 2 c these are the three relations now. That means, we can see here that b and c are related to the pi and the sigmas therefore, the Seebeck voltage which is appearing as an voltage across the thermocouple junctions is related to the first term which comes because of the Peltier effect and the second term which comes because of the Thomson effect. You will also notice the following if for some reason sigma a minus sigma b is very small that is if the Thomson effect in the two conductors a and b are close to each other this will in fact be very small and therefore, the term containing c t squared and uh, this will be small c is equal to you can see sigma a minus sigma b divided by minus t and uh, if c is minus 2 t and uh, c will be small if sigma a minus sigma b is small then you have a true linear temperature relationship between the Seebeck voltage and the temperature. So, we do expect in practice that c will be much smaller than b depending on the combination of materials we have chosen. So, that you have very nearly non-linear relationship but for large temperature range the nonlinear effect is going to become important. So, with this background let us take a look at a simple example. So, I am taking a thermocouple in which I am choosing the material A to be material called chromel I will come back to the materials little later on and uh, the positive element will be chromel A and the element B or the negative element will be alumel these two are alloys of different materials put together metallic alloys. And now, I am going to consider this combination and uh, I will give you the V s t relationship for these two combination which is obtained from the references. So, the V s t relationship is represented in this form this is normal practice in this case I am representing it as a fourth degree polynomial. So, you can see that V s equal to 39.443860 t where t is in degree Celsius V s is in micro volts V s is in micro volts plus 5.89 etcetera to 10 to the power of minus 3 into t squared with the quadratic term this is related to the alpha this is related to the derivative of the alpha as we have just seen from the Kelvin relationships and then we have minus 4.20 etcetera and 10 minus 6 in t cube plus 1.3917 etcetera in 10 to the power of minus 10 into t to the power of 4. This is a, an expression which is expected to give a good representation of the Seebeck effect in 
chromal, alumal, thermocouple pair, where the reference junction is maintained at the ice point. So, with this background, let us just apply the Kelvin relationships, and you will see that I am going to look at what is happening near T equal to 0. I am going to look at near T equal to 0. This corresponds to 273.15 for the Kelvin value and alpha s is equal to d v s by d t. All you have to do is to go back to the previous slide and uh, take the derivative with respect to temperature and then put t equal to 0 in that lower case t equal to 0 and upper case t equal to 275 273.15 and what I will get d v s by d t equal to 39.444 I have simply rounded it out micro volts per degree Celsius. This is the value of alpha. This is the Seebeck coefficient for the material A B being chromal aluminum near T equal to 0. Of course, the alpha value is going to change with temperature as you can see there is a 4 degree polynomial. This will not be constant, it will say slowly vary, vary with respect to temperature. From the Kelvin relation we also have pi A B where A and B are the chromal and aluminum is equal to T alpha and alpha is already determined here. So, T is 273.15 into 39.444 this will give you 10774.1 micro volts. So, the Peltier coefficient is quite a big sizable quantity. If you look at the Thomson coefficients for this material sigma A minus sigma B this comes from the second Kelvin relation minus T d alpha s b d t and d alpha s b d t is nothing but you obtain the derivative by taking the second derivative of this expression put t equal to 0 in that and I will get minus 273.15 into d alpha s b t is nothing but 2 into 0 0.005895 and that will give you minus 3.22064 micro volts. So, what we notice from here is that this is a alpha is about 39 micro volts per degree Celsius. Okay. This is the Seebeck coefficient for chromal aluminum pair. The Peltier coefficient is pretty large equal to 10 to the power of 10, 10,000 a little more than 10,000 or close to say 11,000 micro volts. And the difference between the Thomson effects in the two wires is rather small. That means that the behavior near t equal to 0 will be more or less linear with the these two becoming important. Okay. Now, let us look at the different thermoelectric materials which are available. In fact, in practice what we do is we standardize some thermocouples and we use only those thermocouples. Even though in principle any two materials any two metals or any, any two alloys can be joined together to form a thermocouple it is simply not possible to do that in practice, because it will lead to lot of confusion and uh, each person will have his own thermocouple and so on. It is not a very satisfactory uh, state of affairs. Just to look at some of the thermocouple materials which are available, materials alloys, I have just uh, put them in the following order. If you look at this column for example, 100 degrees means this is the temperature range in which these materials can be used. 500 degrees here means these can be used up to 500 degrees. The material shown in column 3 can be up to 900 or even more. So, the 3 columns tell us the range of temperatures in which these materials can, can be used. Second information which comes from this uh, uh, particular uh, table is that if you take antimony which is the first one in this uh, in the first row or the second row. And if you compare with any of the materials which are shown below that, this will be positive with respect to all of them. That is, if I take antimony and chromal, if I make a junction between these two, the voltage appearing across the two will be positive on the antimony side and chromal will be negative. Okay. So, how do we come, across, come, to, come, to, come to the conclusion regarding this? It is arranged in the more the positive to the top and less positive or negative more negative to the bottom. So, that is the order in which it is put. 
and uh, usually what is done in practice is to use platinum as the reference material and all thermal thermoelectric emfs are measured with respect to platinum as the negative element for example here if i take platinum and cobalt platinum is negative element in general but you see that cobalt is actually negative with respect to platinum the voltage will sign chai sign and the voltage will be changed for example platinum and constant and if i take from here here we can see there's more negative than platinum but platinum is used as the negative element and all thermal thermoelectric power in, in information is given with respect to platinum as the negative element and uh, therefore when i use two different materials not uh, one of them not being platinum for example in the earlier case i had chromal and alumel what i will be doing is i will be taking the difference between the thermoelectric uh, uh, voltages for alumel with respect to platinum and then chromal with respect to platinum and take the difference between these two that will give the total output of that thermocouple so these details are not very essential right now all i want to do is to look at some of the materials antimony and bismuth in fact uh, when uh, the seebeck was trying to discover or trying to look at uh, thermoelectric phenomena he had actually chosen antimony and bismuth and you see that antimony and bismuth are at the top and the bottom of this table that means that the output from an antimony bismuth thermocouple will be the largest of any thermocouple pairs you take from here if you take for example very close to each other silver and platinum rhodium or even platinum rhodium and platinum this will be very small output because they are very close to each other okay so if you want a large seebeck effect choose the material from as close to the top of the table as possible and choose the material as close to the bottom of the table as possible these are all the principles we use actually we will see later that some of the commonly employed thermocouples one which i talked about earlier is chromal alumel you can see chromal is number 2 here aluminum is always at the bottom this is a very common one if you take iron and constantan that also is a very large gap if you take copper and constantan also there is a large gap so you see that if you choose the materials properly you can get sizable seebeck effects so the three columns as i have said are representative of materials which can be used in different temperature ranges and i don't want to go into each one of these you can see the materials and you can see that a large number of materials are in fact available for making thermocouples now with this background let us look at some of the standard thermocouple pairs which are normally used in practice so before we look at these standard thermocouple pairs let me just say that the standardization has been done by the manufacturers by the users by the scientists all coming together and deciding that these are the materials we are going to use and the manufacturers are able to give long lengths of wires made up of these materials of the highest purity whatever is required for thermocouple thermometry practice and therefore it's a cooperation between the manufacturer the metallurgist the users like uh, ourselves and the scientists who look into the basics of thermometry and so on all of them coming together have decided that these are the materials we are going to use normally does it mean that we should not use the other materials no in case in case you have a certain need you can always have your own thermocouple pair and you have to calibrate it and so on and you can you are very really welcome to use that but if you are going to use thermometer thermocouples as a standard method for measuring temperature in the laboratory it is better to go for the standard ones which are available off the shelf from various manufacturers from various countries and it is ready made and you don't have to really spend your time looking at their performance characteristics and so on these are also available in the standard form from the manufacturer's data so what are the different types we have and the color code so the types are given alphabetical names b e j k r s and t these are the different symbols which are used so if i look at b b type thermocouple the positive wire will be 94% platinum 6% rhodium alloy and the negative element will be platinum that's what i mean by plus slash minus wires means the plus is first after the slash comes the negative element so platinum rhodium 94 66 versus platinum 
the color of the platinum rhodium thermocouple wire will be grey that means it is going to be covered with a sheath or a jacket in grey color the negative element is going to be red. In fact, if you see in this table all the negative elements are going to have the same color red and therefore, immediately you can recognize when you look at a thermocouple cable that the one which is red is the negative and the one which is not red, but some other color is going to be the positive element. Next uh, one is chromal constant and let me just go back to the previous slide you see that chromal constant and the advantage of chromal constant and is it is coming from the topmost to the bottom most and you will also see that chromal can be used at 100, 500, 900 that means that I can use it even at 900 degrees. So, entire range of temperature I can cover therefore, chromal constant and has got a large Seebeck effect Seebeck coefficient and also it can be used over extended range of temperatures. So, it is called E type E type means chromal is a positive element constant and is a negative element the color of the positive element is purple red is the negative then J is the iron constant and again if you go back to the previous slide you will see that iron is very close to the top and the constant and is at the bottom this also gives you a sizable output in fact chromal constant and iron constant and chromal alumel and also the copper constant and all have very high Seebeck coefficients. Only thing is E type can be used to high temperatures K type can be also used for to cover very large temperature range, but copper constant and is limited to low temperatures only. Therefore, even though they, they are all similar in their characteristic as far as the Seebeck effect is concerned which means that they have a large output for a given temperature the different ranges can be covered using these thermocouples. So, E type chromal constant and I will quickly go through the entries here J is iron constant and K is chromal alumel this is a very useful thermocouple. K is almost universal in its application it can be used from below room temperature up to about 1300 or more degree Celsius and therefore, it is a very common thermocouple which is used by everybody almost if you if you know if you do not know what the thermocouple is made of chances are that it is going to be chromal alumel thermocouple yellow and red. So, the positive element is yellow and the red is the negative element then there are some which are specifically meant, meant for high temperature thermometry or yes these two are specifically useful for high temperature th uh, measurement. So, platinum 87 rhodium 13 versus platinum black and red plat 87 platinum 13 rhodium element is black and platinum is red this is useful for very high temperatures. The point to note is that if I go back to the previous slide you see platinum is here platinum rhodium is right here and the output is very small that means that they are very close to each other in this table and because of that because of the proximity you are going to have very small Seebeck effect, but the advantage is that it can cover a very large temperature range. Therefore, you do not expect a very large output, but you expect it to be useful for a large temperature range. This is always the problem if some instrument has got a large range usually it will be limited in some other sense and in this case also you will see that it is a large range, but it is going to be less sensitive. Sensitive means the amount of voltage you get for a unit degree difference between the hot and cold junction that is nothing but the Seebeck coefficient. Seebeck coefficient is very small for platinum rhodium platinum thermocouple as compared to the E type and now I will use the symbols E type for example, immediately you should know that it is chromal constant and, and so on. So, the R type and the S type both use platinum rhodium different compositions 9010 or 8713 versus platinum or both of them use black as the color code for the positive element red for the negative element. And the T type thermocouple is also very common especially if you are interested in temperature range below 400 degrees Celsius it is very commonly used in practice. And in the if one is using thermocouples in normal laboratory practice practically everything can be done with the K and the T type thermocouples themselves is very seldom that we require the other thermocouple excepting when the temperature levels are very high. In fact, there are other material other pairs which are not very standard they are used once in a while. 
So I am going to look at them in the next slide. So I am giving some accuracy range values for common thermocouple sensors. The type chromal aluminum K type, it can be used between minus 185 to about 1371, very large temperature range and the accuracy is plus or minus 2 degree Celsius in this range. And it can also be used between in two ranges minus 18 to 277 and 277 to 1371, this plus or minus 0.75 percent corresponds to the second range. The J type thermocouple ion constant and minus 190 to plus 760, then you see the numbers here which are characteristic of the accuracy you can expect with this. Copper constant and a T type minus 190 to plus 400, you see that there are three different ranges minus 190 to minus 60. Actually you can see that it covers a very wide range from the negative side also below the room temperature minus 190 to minus 60 plus or minus 2 percent minus 60 to 93 plus or minus 0 0.8 degrees and the 93 to 370 0.75 percent plus minus. Then we have the S type which is the high temperature thermocouple pair P T 90 R H 10 versus P T so S type. It can be used between 0 and 1760 degrees Celsius very wide range of temperatures plus or minus 0 0.5 percent that is what you expect between 538 and 1482 plus or minus 2.8 degrees between 0 and 538. Then there is a very special type of thermocouple which uses tungsten versus tungsten rhodium different compositions tungsten 95 rhodium 5, tungsten 74 rhodium 26, tungsten versus tungsten 74 rhodium 26. So, these are two special thermocouple pairs. The range of temperature is 0 to 2870 very high temperature that is the advantage of this and uh, the accuracy is obtainable about plus or minus 5 degrees 4.5 degrees or plus or minus 1 percent depending on the range. So, what, what do we learn from this table? We learn from the table that you cannot uh, you, are, you do not expect the temperature to be measured very accurately because there are inherent inaccuracies in the measurement. And therefore, we will be happy if these numbers which are given in these tables are achieved. So, now let us look at how to represent the data for a thermocouple pair. I am taking an example of a K type thermocouple pair which is the chromal alumal and in this case the information is available in two different forms you can use. One is in the form of a table and I have taken the excerpt from a table for K type thermocouple the table is constructed like this. The first column degree Celsius, in the first column it goes by 0, 10, 20 like that, it goes in uh, steps of 10 degrees and the other columns is goes by steps of 1 degree. Okay. So, you can see 0, 1, then there is a gap here that means 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, then 9, 10, I have taken the some portion of the table that means there are several columns which I have just shown by two dots here and uh, let us look at the kind of information you get from the table. The reference junction is always at the ice point therefore, if the measuring junction is also at 0 degrees you expect 0 voltage no output if the reference junction and the measuring junction are at the same temperature and in this case they are at the ice point. Then if it is 1 degree difference 0 0.039 if you remember 39 micro volts, we had already alpha s value near t equal to 0, we calculated earlier in example 10. So, this 0 0.039 is nothing but 39 micro volts or 0 0.039, this is milli volts, what we are given here is milli volt. Then 0 0.357, 0 0.397 and again it starts 10, 11 up to 20, so 0 0.397 goes up to 0 0.798 and there is a gap here there are many more entries then I have taken 100 degrees you get about 4.095 or about 4.1 millivolt is what you expect from a K type thermocouple. When the temperature difference between the two junctions is equal to is the same as the steam point minus the ice point 100 degrees is the steam point as one atmospheric pressure and 0 degrees is the ice point 
the difference between these two is 100 degrees you get about 5 millivolts. So, now you also realize that if you want to use the thermocouple the kind of voltage difference or the potential difference we should uh, be able to measure is in millivolts and if the uh, range is let us say 0 to 600 in this case the maximum output you are going to get about 25 millivolts the minimum is about 0 millivolts here ok about 25 millivolts. So, you can choose the proper instrument to measure the potential difference these potentiometers are the voltage measuring devices are available in different ranges and so on or you may buy an one which contains several ranges and use the appropriate range for each one of the ranges of temperature. If you are measuring between 0 and uh, let us say 100 vo vo volts you put it to 0 and 5 millivolt range if it is 100 if it is up to 600 then of course, you require up to 25 millivolts and of course, it can go up if you go above. If you remember the K type thermocouple can be used up to about 1350 degree Celsius it can the table will be going up to that value. So, what happens if you go close to that or you, you exceed that temperature is that the temperature material the material of the thermocouple is not going to be stable it will undergo either a chemical change or a physical change and therefore, the thermocouple becomes useless. So, the useful range of a thermocouple is determined by the properties of the material one is thermoelectric properties the second is the physical properties of the material. If the material becomes not unusable because it melts or it becomes soft and so on then that is the temperature up to which you can use it. Obviously, the thermocouple with uh, tungsten and tungsten uranium you can see it is melting point is very very high and therefore, we are able to use it up to about 2000 3800 or whatever number was given in earlier. <coughs> so, the K type thermocouple characteristic looks like this if I make a plot for the range from 0 to 1350 are given. So, if you go through look at this one if you were to draw a straight line it will go somewhere like that therefore, there is a slight nonlinearity and that is because of the 4 degree polynomial I am going to use for representing the data and you can also see that at about 1350 degrees you get something more than 50 millivolts at the output the very sizable output and it can be easily measured by most of the modern instruments. So, the performance the characteristic which is given here is the same as what is given in the form of table I have just made a plot of the same information. So, there are two ways of doing it one is give a table then make a tab uh, make a plot of uh, Seebeck voltage versus temperature with the ice point as the reference junction or I can represent the information in the form of a polynomial which was given in example 10 earlier V s equal to something multiplied by t plus t squared plus t cube t to the power of 4 this is one way of representing the information. There are two ways in which we are going to use the information given either in the table form or in the form of uh, the, uh, the plot or in the form of a polynomial. We will be measuring the in the in the application where we are going to use the thermocouple to measure the temperature we are measuring the voltage. So, I know the V s I do not know the temperature if I am going to use a polynomial in this form V s equal to a function of temperature like this it is going to be very difficult because I have to find a value for T which corresponds to which gives the value of V s I have measured. Therefore, what, what I am going to do is I am also going to represent an inverse relationship between temperature as a function of V s. So, just to indicate how it is done let me just uh, look at So, the one way of doing it is to if you remember we had E V s is equal to a polynomial in T we had a quartic actually a, a quartic that means that the polynomial was degree 4 we can also have T is equal to a polynomial in V s. So, we can call this as the direct relationship and this is the inverse relationship. 
So, it is always better to have these two relations, so that we can either do this for the direct calculation that is you want to find out what is the Seebeck voltage for a given temperature or you can use the second one to find out what is the temperature corresponding to the voltage which has been measured in the experiment. In fact, the standardization let us just write it here standardization makes it possible to have these specified once for all that is the manufacturer is going to make, make the thermocouple wires using standard materials of high purity. He is going to conduct either himself some experiments or he is going to subject his material to experimentation in a standardization laboratory. In the standardization laboratory, the procedure of measuring temperature according to ITS 90 will be followed and they are going to calibrate the thermocouple by using several fixed points. And after obtaining this, this uh, the values of the Seebeck voltage at several fixed points, a polynomial is fit using the regression methods. We have already regression analysis method, which we have already indicated earlier when we were talking about data analysis. So, those polynomials are once for all given and uh, they are available in the form of documents where for each particular each type of uh, standard material like B, K, T etcetera, these polynomials are already available in the literature or by the manufacturer or the in the standard uh, whatever is given by the standard laboratory. So, what I am going to do is I am simply going to borrow them and use them. In case I do that, if the thermocouple I have got with me is not exactly like the thermocouple which was used for standardization, I might have some errors. So, I will come back to this question of how to look at these errors little later on, but in principle I am going to use these tables which are given by the manufacturer to measure the temperature. So, with this background let me go back to the slide show and uh, look at some other practical aspects whatever is possible within the next uh, few minutes available to us in this lecture. The thermocouples let me just uh, highlight that it contains as you can see two wires and these two wires are to be should not touch each other anywhere excepting near the junction where the two materials are going to be in intimate contact. If you remember the circuits which you were drawing all the time there were two junctions and the wires were shown separated. Actually the wires are not separated in practice they are going to go through a cable that means that they are going to be like any other electrical wire which you see in the market. So, the two wires the positive and the negative are going to be joined together only at the junction and after that it is going to be individually insulated electrically insulated using a sheath material and in fact, we have already referred to the color coding for the sheath material. And usually these two wires are again put inside a sheath which is going to cover the entire thing. Normally the sheath which covers the two cables together will be a brown colored uh, either plastic or some other material which is going to be the sheath material. That means, we need some some electrically resisting or electrically resisting covering electrically resisting covering around the two wires and uh, the covering material can be different types of materials and these insulation materials are given in this table. So, nylon it can be used between minus 40 and 160 degrees that is relatively low temperatures PVC polyvinyl chloride minus 40 to 105 then we have enamel up to about 107 degrees cotton over enamel. So, you have enamel covering the wire and over that there is a cotton covering up to 107 you can have silicone rubber over fiberglass minus 40 to 232 you see that as you go down here the temperature range is increasing. I am going to materials which are useful for higher and higher temperatures. Teflon and fiberglass minus 120 to 250, asbestos we can go up to 650, tempered fiberglass I can go up to 650, 
and this the refractor is a manufactured item which is a trade name for that material which may contain silica and other materials in it this can go up to about 1000 degrees or more so these are the normal insulating materials which are used and in case we don't have any material which can be used for the insulation we may have to use the two wires the two wires have to be run separately away from each other by using a for example like in the electrical heaters the heating elements we have porcelain beads we can use similarly porcelain tubes or porcelain bead which is going to do that one so we come to the question of ceramic protecting tube materials this is what we were talking about just now you use instead of a covering in the form of a sheath you can use a tube i can use a quartz tube i can have a quartz tube with two holes in the tube through which the two wires can be run it can be it is nothing but quartz fused silica as a composition i can go up to 1260 siliramic silica and alumina combination this is a registered trademark 1650 and you can see that alumina pure alumina 99% pure can go up to about 1870 there is of course silicon nitride with silicon carbide and so on these are materials which are used for very high temperature work these are actually ceramic protecting tubes sometimes even metal tubes can be used with a ceramic in between the metal and the wire which we want to insulate the next question i am going to ask is how are we going to make this junction between the two material materials the two wires these are all the practical aspect we'll quickly go through if one wants to learn all these thing one has to go to the references which uh, describe in great detail these procedures and so on and uh, we don't have time to do that in this uh, set of lectures we are giving there's a lot of uh, things to be talked about and we will just as go over quickly the thermo uh, couple junction types we can have grounded grounded junction this is a sheath material which is made up of a material metal like stainless steel or nickel or some such material and i have attached the two wires directly on to the sheath material at the bottom and the junction between the two materials is formed between this and this by the sheath which is going to be in contact with the two metals okay that's why it's called the grounded junction we can also have an exposed junction the two wires are brought out of the sheath and they are welded like this there is a butt weld and this is an exposed junction the advantage between the with the exposed junction is that it has a quicker time response for any changes in the temperature it responds more quickly as compared to the grounded junction because it is in direct contact with the material whose temperature i want to measure you can also have what is called a separated wire junction which is very common in practice in a metallurgical practice where you want to measure temperature of molten metal the molten metal itself forms the junction so you have the k type thermocouple let us say you have the k chromal and aluminum coming out of the sheath and these two are not connected directly there is no welding or a joint between the two and the molten material which is going to be surrounding this automatically provides the contact between the two junction two materials and it forms the junction so separated wire junction junction is being formed by the metal or the molten metal in which it is going to be immersed you can also have what is called a button junction so we have a copper button button is like it's like a button the cylindrical small disc to which the two wires are attached and of course there is a ceramic sheath so that there is no physical contact electrical contact between the two two uh, wires this wire and the these two wires excepting through this copper button and in order to understand why these junction things junctions work in practice we have to uh, learn a few more things which we will do later on more junction types i have uh, two more which are very useful one is called the twisted weld junction normal practice you take the you remove the sheath up to a certain length of the wire this is the positive and this is negative let us say then you twist the two things together and make a bead here by welding the two materials to form a contact you can also do a butt welded junction where the two wires are brought like this and right there there is a butt weld and in fact the welding can be done by several methods you are you, you can even use soldering as a method for making the bead so what uh, is normally done is we charge the capacitor to a high voltage and then 
to the two terminals of the, uh, the capacitor are connected to the, the bead here and you, op you close the switch immediately the charge in the capacitor is going to be discharged through this material and will heat the heat the material locally and it will form a nice weld at the to form a nice junction. And usually you want to form a nice spherical bead for the junction and it should be as small as possible. It should be as uh, because it depends on of course the wire diameter and so on. If you use very small diameter wires you can make very small beads which will be sub millimeter diameter and the smaller the bio diameter of the bead the higher the faster the response of the thermocouple when you want to use it to measure temperatures which are varying with respect to time. Another possible way of doing making a thermocouple is to use what is called a bayonet or the pencil type. In this case I am using a iron constantan thermocouple which is J type. The tube is made of iron, the tube is made of iron, the constant and wire is right in the middle of the tube and it is attached to the bottom of the tube here. So, the junction is here and in between the constant and wire and the outer iron tube I have got some fiberglass insulation which prevents any contact between two and these two the constant and, and the iron are brought to the terminal block and from the terminal block I can take connection to the voltage measuring device. So, we have a bayonet or pencil type device the temperature surround in this area is measured by introducing the bayonet or the pencil through the side of the place away. For example, if you want to measure the temperature in a big uh, duct or some such thing you can introduce it from a hole through a hole in the center in the side and then you will be measuring the temperature of the fluid which is flowing inside the duct. So, with the practical aspects in mind now let us go back and see how a thermocouple circuit is to be made what are the principles involved in this. So, that you are able to measure the temperature which you intend to measure as accurately as possible without making any blunders or without committing any blunders in the process. So, let me just go through the simplest form of thermocouple circuit which is shown here. I have the positive wire which I call as P, I have got the negative wire and I have got the measuring junction there is a I have made a bead here and the negative material is now brought here and there is a bead with a positive material. So, you see that the voltage is measured between the positive and the positive. There are two junctions the measuring junction P n and the reference junction is the n p if you go in this direction or in one, one direction or the other you will see that you are going from p to n from n to p. And then I have got two terminals where the p material or the positive material has come and it are attached. These two terminals are the terminals of the voltmeter because the voltmeter has to be connected to measure the voltage across the two thermocouples wires and therefore, you have got two terminals and chances are the wire which is connecting inside is not necessarily either P or N material. Chances are it is a different material for example, I may have copper here this is a copper. So, immediately you see that if you have positive material here and copper and copper and positive material here there are two junctions formed between P and copper or P and some third material and again another junction P and third material one in this in this direction the other one in this direction. If the two terminals are at the same temperature we will come back to this question a little later. If the two terminals are at the same temperature this inform this is not going to affect the measurement. Okay. If the two temp terminals are not at the same temperature we have to worry about it. Normally what is to be done is these two terminals are, are placed on a what is called a junction box and the junction box consists of a material of high thermal kinetic material like a block of aluminum or block of copper on that you have two insulated lugs and to each lug you can come connect the wires 
and the insulated lug will prevent direct contact or shortage between shorting between the two terminals, but it will be in contact with a material of high thermal conductivity which can be maintained if necessary by cooling it or by placing it contact with some fluid whose temperature is constant. That means, that I have to maintain the temperature of the two terminals at the same value. If you do that, you will be able to whatever thermoelectric voltage you measure between this junction and this junction by the voltmeter, that you can plug into the formula which we gave earlier. If you are using the K type thermocouple, you use that formula. If it is some other type, you go to get the right kind of form polynomial and substitute and you get the value of the temperature. You use the inverse relationship. Now, let us look at the details of what is happening in the wires. So, what I am doing is, I am looking at the temperature variation along the wires in this circuit. There are several wires, P wire here, there is the N wire here, another P wire here and maybe some other material copper whatever. So, I am going to look at the temperature variation along these wires, because if you remember the thermoelectric phenomena is due to the temperature variation all along the wires which are used for making the thermocouple. We have the Peltier effect which is uh, localized at the junction, we have the Thomson effect which is going to take place all along the wires which are connecting the different parts of the circuit. So, if there are three temperatures effectively T m, then T r and T a. These are the three temperature levels in this particular problem. So, what I am going to do is to look at the temperature variation along each wire. Suppose, I take the wire P here, at, at this point it is temperature is T a, at this temp is point temperature is T m. Therefore, temperature has to reduce along here from T m to T a and it probably will do according to this it varies like this and comes to T a. Similarly, you take the n type thermo th n uh, type material, it is going from T m and then it is going to T r, but somewhere here it may be at the ambient temperature. So, what you expect is that it also goes to T a and then further as you go near the near the reference junction it is going to the ice point. So, ice point that means, it is going to be at this temperature. So, the temperature in the P wire is going like this and becoming T a, the N wire is going like this becoming T a and then again it goes down to the ice point and at the ice point the other material is the P material which is going to go from the ice point to the ambient temperature or T a and that is what is happening. Actually, the distance between the junction P and uh, the T m and this and the junction and the voltmeter may, may be quite large. For example, if I am using a very thin wire of diameter let us say 0 0.1, 0 0.5 millimeter let us say, the length of the wire may be 1 meter in which case it is a very very far off. The length of the wire is very large compared to the cross sectional diameter of the wire. So, the point is this temperature variation is localized close to the high temperature zone, this is close to the low temperature zone. Therefore, the, the this portion which I am showing here and which I am showing here which is at the room temperature or ambient temperature is a very long length. Therefore, if you look at the thermoelectric phenomena which is taking place, we can say that thermoelectric phenomena is taking place close to the junction here and the close to the junction here, because the Thomson EMF is generated only when there is a variation in the temperature, only when there is a variation temperature along the wire. Therefore, you can say that the Thomson effect, of course, the Peltier effect is localized at the junction. Therefore, in view of the fact that these wires are very long, and the temperature variation is localized near the junction, we can say that the thermoelectric effect or thermoelectric phenomena which is taking place is localized to the junction area and therefore, we need not waste the good material P material or N material by having very long wires or made up of thermocouple wires. Therefore, normally what is done in practice is to replace 
or to go from very close to the junction maybe we can take a few centimeters or few maybe few tens of centimeters of the thermocouple wire and then from there onwards we can use a lead wire which need not be the thermocouple wire which is usually very expensive. So, what we will do in the next lecture is to look at this aspect and then we will take up a few examples of how thermocouple circuits are analyzed and then we will be able to come to the question of the errors in thermometry using thermoelectric uh, uh, thermometer the thermocouples and we will look at how to estimate these errors, how to look at these errors or model these errors in thermal in terms of uh, heat transfer models and how to calculate these errors. This will be the uh, done in the next one or two lectures. Thank you. Thank you.